coming up, the man who takes many different wines and turns them into one great champagne. Now, Richard, you have the title of chef de cave. You're in charge of all the blending. You have total power. So what is it that you do that makes the product one of the best in the world? I would say creativity, inspiration. It's about the crafting of the wine. It's about the blending of the vineyard components. I really believe that what makes uh, Dom Pignon so special is that uh, every time, every single vintage of Dom Pignon is different. Once blended, the wine is bottled and laid to rest, gaining creaminess and complexity as it ages. When it's ready, the yeast is collected in the neck of the bottle through a process called riddling. So, Gordon, this is the riddling here. Uh, once we decide... Riddling? Riddling. What's riddling? Riddling basically is the later stage of the, the making. You know, the sediment of yeast, which is at the very bottom of the, the bottle, and we have to tilt that bottle up, uh -huh. and same time, turn Loosen it uh, and yeah, let it all yeah, fall. Yeah, exactly. So this bottle has not been touched for seven years until now. Yeah, exactly. These guys are disturbing their sleep. They're waking up the champagne. Yeah. How many bottles a year would this risk turn? Combien, combien de, de bouteilles par an tournez-vous? Par an? Yeah. Vous avez autour de 500 000 à 600 000 bouteilles. Yeah. 600,000 bottles a year. 600,000 bottles per wrist. Yeah. That's 1.2 million. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> These are the wrists of a champagne superhero. When the yeast is removed, the champagne gets a tiny shot of wine and sugar to replace what was lost. All dressed up with a new cork and label, it's ready to make its debut. So this has been waiting for 15 years for this moment. It's only to check. Could it be Isn't bad? It? Can you have an unpleasant experience? Could it possibly yeah, Because be? of the cork, you know, we, we know that sometimes we have one off. Not the vintage. No, not the vintage. Okay. It's all about the ceiling. Why don't you taste and see what you think your forebears did 15 years ago? What does it taste like? It does, uh, does taste uh, great. It tastes like Dom Pedro 88. Now, when you say that, that means something. Because you've got little 80, compartments in your head yeah, for all the uh, years. 88 was really one of those uh, demanding uh, vintages. It's, demanding? Uh, yeah. Uh, rather very austere and it takes quite some time to, to open up. But not every year is good enough to be a vintage year and to be called Dom Perignon, correct? Yeah, correct. We just cannot make a Dom Perignon every year for reasons of quality and for reasons of uh, identity of Dom Perignon. It's just not in the grapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the vintages just cannot make it into the, the unique character of Dom Perignon. But let's be real, it's a commercial world. Whether you decide to call it Dom Perignon vintage or not, rests hundreds of millions of dollars. Doesn't somebody tap you on the shoulder and say, come on, give it a nudge, they're out there waiting. Yeah, but you just cannot cut corners in anything. You know, there is a huge, uh, long history of a uh, of all the vintages and cuvées of Dom Pignon, you just cannot uh, right. jeopardize uh, for just short-term uh, purposes. It's all long distance. You know, current vintage of Dom Pignon is 95. It will keep for up to 100 years in our cellars. That's right, 100 years. What most people don't know is that Dom Perignon has a secret stash of champagnes in its wine library, something they call the Inotech but we discovered with some insistent probing. Are there wines in this cellar right now that are as good as that, that you have on hold? Yes, I uh, have 59. I have, uh, oh, you're not telling one. me? Is it a secret? <laughs> you can't tell me? Yeah, it's Dom Pignon in the tech, meaning wine library Dom Pignon. Late release of all the vintages of Dom Pignon. There's a wine here, bottled in 1959, that's so good, uh, you're not giving it to anybody yet. Yeah, waiting. Uh, it's You're time. waiting? Yeah. But it's... It's all about passion. So. But it's over 50 years. It's time, huh? It's all right. <laughs> Behind these locked gates is possibly one of the most valuable collections of champagne in the world. And we are going to go inside and look at it exclusively for the first time when we return. Maybe even a little taste. I'm dreaming. We'll look. In a moment, we discover Champagne's greatest seller. This first one is your basic flute. As you see, tall and thin, 
the shape of it captures uh, the bubbles and doesn't allow the bubbles to escape, which is good. Other than that, it's a simple style, and the flute, I think, should be used for less expensive champagnes and sparkling wines. This is your basic tulip, and this is the best probably all-around champagne glass. This can be used for all champagnes, but especially for better champagnes. It's tall, it has the shape of a tulip, it comes in at the top to hold on to the bubbles. It's a very good glass. This happens to be my favorite. It's called the Ampitriable, which means the pitiless one. Actually, it's perfect for champagne because it has all these ridges and it just holds on to all those bubbles and it comes in at the top. And to me, this is, this is the glass I use all the time. I love this for champagne. I think it's the best champagne glass.